moment I would uh, thank the organizers for inviting me. <laughs> but um, <laughs> since I am one of the organizers myself, I think instead I owe you a bit of an explanation why it's me standing here. So, in fact, it should have been Anna Spinelli's talk, so that's her. So Anna Spinelli recently obtained her PhD in my group, and she was first author on a large part of the work that I'll be showing now, and also an important uh, contributor to the rest. Um, so, uh, yeah, you might wonder what, what reason there is that uh, she declined to talk today. And she actually has a very good reason, because last Saturday her son, Tomasa, was born. Uh, and uh, I've heard that both mother and son are in great condition, except not in good enough condition to give a talk here. So that's why I'm, uh, <laughs> why I'm talking. Um, on the slide you also see the rest of my team. So uh, Jan and R Ranko and Flores are all here. Then Ben Bryant recently moved on to a new position in Nijmegen. And that leaves only my master student Bruno in charge of the lab right now, which is a little bit scary. But I think, um, I think all will be fine. Um, there's also my collaborators. I collaborate with uh, Joaquin and also with Marcus and with uh, Jean-Sébastien Coe at the University of Amsterdam. And the title of my talk today is almost exactly the same as the title of the whole workshop because this is really the direction that I want to push my group into. So I want to use all the techniques that we have obtained so far to build spin lattices that, and, and spin models that the theorists have been working on and really make this link to the quantum magnetism community. So that's what we're aiming at. Now, already in the first few talks this morning, we mentioned spin and magnets. So let me quickly uh, uh, repeat them. So, uh, I'm interested in collective excitations in spin chains. So spin-ons and magnons are those. So a spin-on is a domain wall in an antiferromagnetic chain, so a domain wall between two nail phases. And that domain wall can propagate as if it were a particle that only carries a spin one half and no mass and no charge. And then it has a wave function just like any other quantum mechanical particle. A magnon is similar. It is a singly flipped spin inside a ferromagnetic chain and therefore carries a spin one. It actually consists of two spin-ons that are bound together, cannot be uh, separated, and also has a wave function. And as you will see, I think we've been able to make both these sorts of excitations in atomically assembled spin chains uh, in the few works that I will show. So the techniques that we use to study the spins of our atoms, we've already discussed them, so Cyrus gave a great introduction, so let me be fast. On the one hand, we use spin-polarized STM, where we attach a single magnetic atom to our tip, and then we test whether the atom that we're probing is parallel to that spin or anti-parallel. But more importantly, we use inelastic electron tunneling spectroscopy, where we use a non-magnetic tip and then measure as a function of the applied voltage the differential conductance. And then spin excitations appear as individual steps at a certain voltage that tells us the energy of the excitation. And the height of the step tells us how probable each excitation is, and therefore the selection rules uh, that, that are re related to these excitations are encoded in these step heights. So there's a lot of information to be learned from these spectra. The workhorse for many of our experiments is the iron atom on copper nitride. And as Cyrus beautifully explained, the iron atom is incorporated into the surface molecular covalent network of nitrogen and co uh, uh, copper atoms. And as a result, its environment is strongly anisotropic. In one direction, it has two nitrogen atoms as neighbors to which it is covalently bound. And in the 90 degree rotated direction, it has no neighbors. We call that the vacancy direction. And as we showed in 2007, this geometrical anisotropy also gives rise to a strong magnetic anisotropy. And that magnetic anisotropy explains exactly the positions of these steps. So in particular, we learned that it is an easy access system with a spin two. And therefore, these excitations at 4 and 6 millivolts, the green and blue ones, are attempts to kick the spin from the plus 2 state over the barrier to the minus 2 state, either over the vertical plane or in the horizontal plane. Th that's why it's two excitations. But then this additional excitation at low energy, that is marked red here, is the quantum tunneling of magnetization. Because this is an integer spin system, and therefore the, the states can mix, and they will mix. So the real eigenstate here is not either plus 2 or minus 2, but the perfect superposition of plus 2 and minus 2. So the very existence of the low energy excitation is a proof that a single iron atom is not magnetically stable in the classical sense, but is a quantum object. When you apply a strong magnetic field along the easy axis, that step disappears, so the, the Hamiltonian becomes more diagonal, you could say, but still a single atom is not magnetically stable. Now, as Sebastian Loth and co-workers demonstrated a few years ago, if you couple a few of these iron atoms together, you do get magnetic bistability. And what I particularly love about this experiment is that they show that if you just add two atoms to a chain of six, it, the intrinsic switching rate goes down by a factor thousand. 
So we are really witnessing here the transition from a quantum spin to a classical magnet, really a magnet in the, in the definition that we used earlier this week that has remnants, and that transition is super steep, and it's beautiful that we can see that. Now, quantum, uh, sorry, uh, magnetic stability was also found in ferromagnetic structures. This was in Professor Wiesenanger's group in, in Hamburg. So there are five iron atoms here put together in a cluster, and here you see the hallmark of ferromagnetic coupling, namely one of the two states, when a small magnetic field is applied, one of the two states is strongly favored over the other. So this is really a ferromagnet. Uh, and as we've seen uh, yesterday, actually, uh, now we can also say that uh, on a single atom, on uh, uh, magnesium oxide, you can also have such switching. It's not included in the slides, but it's now also proven. Um, but what is missing here, in my opinion, is you cannot see what is actually happening during the switching process. So the switching process is uh, effectively instantaneous in both these experiments. So what I really like to see is what kind of excitations are involved in this switching process. And that's what my experiments can show a little bit more. And that brings me to the first part of the uh, excitations, the magnons or spin waves that we saw on a ferromagnetic bit. So we built a ferromagnetic bit, also of iron atoms on copper nitride. This can be done by just putting them on a slightly different orientation. This is a 45 degree rotated orientation. Um, but other than that, the coupling strength is very comparable to uh, the antiferromagnetic uh, uh, structures, except it's ferromagnetic here. Um, and then the movie here, that I will start now, shows the idea of the experiment. So um, we have two states. I call them ground state and ground state star. One of them is 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. The other one is minus 2, minus 2, minus 2. I apply a small magnetic field to be able to measure the difference with my spin polarized tip. So one state is slightly favored over the other, but the energy difference is small compared to the energy barrier that separates them. So you still have two separate states. Then we can inject with our tip, we can inject electrons anywhere in the chain we want and thus excite a spin wave state. But depending on where I try to inject electrons, either on the node or an anti-node of a spin wave state, I can build up a lot of amplitude or not. And as we have shown here, only when you hit it on the anti-node, you can really uh, have a high probability of flipping the bit to the other side. And this was featured on the cover of Nature Materials last year. So that was the cartoon movie. So let's look at the actual experiment now. So this is a spin polarized measurement taken on this uh, six atom bit. You can barely recognize the atoms here. They're really close. Um, and you see here the typical switching. You also see that one state is favored over the other. That's clear. But what is most important here is that the switching rate was observed to be much faster when you're on the outside of the chain than when you're on the, in the bulk. And this is only a trace of 100 seconds, but of course we took a lot of statistics, we took hundreds of, of switching events, and we saw that both when going from the unfavored to the favored state, or going from the favored to the unfavored state, which is a lot slower, but in both cases the rate was much faster when you're towards the, out of the outside of the chain, and that's not just because the outer atoms have only one neighbor, because also the second atoms were much faster than the, uh, than the inner and the outer atoms. What we also found is that the switching rate really starts to take off when you apply a voltage of 3.5 millivolts or more. So below 3.5 millivolts, there was only intrinsic switching, and that didn't depend on the position of the tip much. But this, this whole effect started to happen from 3.5 millivolts onwards. So something, some state is living at 3.5 millivolts that is responsible for this switching. So what state is that? We can see that by switching to our other measurement technique. So we drop off our magnetic atom from the tip and now we have a spin unpolarized tip. Um, and then we take spectroscopy. And normally we plot spectroscopy in this uh, mode with the first derivative where the excitations are steps. For this purpose, I've switched to the second derivative, so now every step becomes either a peak or a dip. And these spectra I've plotted here in a color scale for each of my six atoms. And then the corresponding theory is here on the right. What we see here, first of all, we see that at zero energy, there is no excitation. There is a gap of three and a half millivolts, and inside there, there's only noise. So that means that this, this stepper in the middle that, that I told you is the sign that you have a quantum system and not a magnetically stable system, that step is gone. So we really have a magnetically stable system. It's very clear. What is also very nice is that the first excited state is the same for all the atoms. No matter whether you're a bulk atom or out atom, you have the same first energy excited state. So we're talking about collective modes here that are uh, a property of the whole chain. And then from that first excitation onward, we see a nodal structure. So the next mode has an anti-node, node, anti-node, anti-node, node, anti-node, node, anti-node, anti and so forth. 
So afterwards, of course, we cannot resolve the individual nodes anymore because we only have six atoms, but the theory exactly confirms that these should be spin waves. So we are really looking at spin waves or magnons in this case. Now, what is very intriguing about this is if I compare these chains to some of the other chains that were built on copper nitride, I see something very interesting. So let's first look here at the right. This is the work from uh, Cyrus 2006. These are manganese atoms that are uh, coupled very strongly antiferromagnetically. What was found here is that it doesn't matter where you are on the structure, you always get the same spectra. So here we see spectra for different chain lengths, but once you had a five atom chain, it doesn't matter where you put the, the tip on the, on the chain, you get the same spectrum everywhere. On the other side, we have here the antiferromagnetic structures, the ones that Sebastian used for his bits. So these, these are the same, these are four atom and five atom. And here it was found, antiferromagnetically coupled also, that the spectrum only depends on the local environment. So if you take a spectrum on outer atom, you have low energy excitations. If you take a spectrum on inner atom that has two neighbors, you have high energy excitations, but that's all. There's no other information inside the chain anymore. So only the local information gives the spectra. Then our case is really in between. So we see a collective mode. We see something that is a property of the whole chain, like here but we do see a structure inside the chain. It does matter where on the chain I am probing. And this is quite interesting. And I really don't understand why the, magn the magnitude of the coupling is really identical to the antiferromagnetic case. It's just a sign that it's different, but we see qualitatively total different uh, behavior, and I, I would love to understand that. So if anyone has an idea, please let me know. Yeah. No, it, it, it comes out of the model, certainly, okay. but, but there's, no, there's no intuitive way for oh, me to understand exactly. why the behavior is so different. Okay. Yeah. It's, just, yeah. it's just an intuition for... Yes, 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 but, but the models all agree, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, now that we know this bit so precisely, we can calculate the exact eigenstates of the bit. This was done in, together with uh, Fernando and with Joaquin. So here you see it's, it's a bit not so clear, but you see the first 100 eigenstates of the six atom bit, so there's a lot of states here but there's no states here. So what you see here, these are the lowest energy states that separate the two. And interestingly, this, the barrier is not at all parabolic, as we always show, but it's more like a square, where on the edges of the square, there's the spin waves, and on the roof, there's domain wall states. And in order to get from one side to the other, you have to in, uh, excite into a spin wave, and then get onto this roof, and then you roll to the other side, and you fall down. And using polymaster equations, we've been able to really calculate what is the probability if I make a single excitation with the tip on a certain particular atom, what is the chance that I flip the bit and all these calculations match up with our experiments. Okay, so, so far about the magnons in the, in the bits. So eventually now I want to switch to um, spin-on physics in antiferromagnetic chains, but before I do so, I would like to briefly talk about a smaller system, namely the two impurity condom model, that was described also on Monday, uh, the theory of this at least, uh, in, in a lot of detail. So the two impurity condo problem is very interesting. If you have two condo impurities that are coupled to each other, um, a lot depends on the, the interaction strength between your atoms, the coupling strength of your atoms to the bath, and also the magnetic field that you apply. And each of these three things can compete with each other. For example, when the, uh, the exchange interaction between your atoms dominates, you just get a two impurity singlet that is not condo screened. If you apply a very strong magnetic field and the field dominates, you just get two separate magnetic moments that are uh, magnetized along the field and, and nothing else happens. But in between there's an interesting region where all three uh, parameters compete with each other and that is the two impurity condo screening phase. And at this point you have a threefold degeneracy between up and down, down up and up up. All these three together are degenerate. What's the vertical axis there? The vertical axis, sorry, is the field. Scaled by the, the condo energy, which is the field. And horizontal is the exchange interaction. This is anti-ferromagnetic, ferromagnetic. So in this region, you have a very inter interesting piece of condo uh, physics. Now, of course, this has been studied in uh, uh, many experiments. Uh, so for example, this paper by Pruse uh, and co-workers that uh, discuss buried magnetic impurities where they can play with the distance between the impurities. And also Björk et al. in, uh, in Nature Physics have shown that if you attach one condom impurity to the tip and the other one to the surface, you can continuously tune the interaction strength between them. However, all these experiments were done at zero magnetic field. And the reason is that the condom temperatures were so high in these experiments that it doesn't make sense to apply magnetic field because the magnetic field cannot split the peak anyway. 
So if I would plot these experiments in this phase diagram, they would all be here at the lower edge, a zero field. So the transition measured here in the Björk paper is from the single condo impurity to the singlet state, <coughs> but it doesn't access the two impurity condo state at all. Now with our cobalt atoms on copper nitride, we have a much lower condo temperature and we can apply magnetic fields. So we can actually make dimers in different ways and really slice through this uh, phase diagram and access all the different phases. So we start here with the cobalt atom on copper nitride. This was shown in 2008 to have a, uh, a condo uh, temperature of 2.5 Kelvin roughly. Uh, and then uh, a, a hard axis anisotropy that brings up the three half doublet to six millivolts. So you have a, a condo screen one half doublet at low energy. And then we found that if you park one of these cobalt atoms here in the middle and you park another one around it, so you park the second cobalt atom on any of these colored circles, then the color of the circle gives you the, uh, the exchange interaction that is, uh, that is in the resulting dimer. So this is not theory, this experiment. We, we actually extracted this from all our measurements by doing spectroscopy. So we can go from strong anti-ferromagnetic coupling to fairly strong ferromagnetic coupling, just as with the iron atoms and everything in between. So that gives us all the positions on the horizontal axis. And then once we have built all these dimers, we can apply magnetic fields up till eight Tesla. And, uh, and we can slice through this uh, phase diagram. Now, what do we get? We have, for example, here a dimer that we call 2,0 that is all the way here far at the right. So this is just, this is in, the, in a singlet state and nothing is changing to that. There's this other dimer, the 1,1, one, one, the diagonal one, that's all the way to the left and it's just in a triplet state and nothing is happening to it. But there's two interesting cases, for example, the 0,2 dimer and the 3 half, 1 half dimer that are really going through this green region over here. And if you look closely, you see that in this plot, there's both blue dots, which are, the, uh, which are the data, but there's also a green line, which are uh, curves that we made with uh, Marcus's new uh, fitting tool to, uh, to uh, model these curves uh, with a third order perturbation uh, uh, procedure. And as Marcus described himself, um, that model cannot quite capture the strong condo interactions in the, in the strong condo limit. So right at the moment when we, s when we go through these regions, we see that the discrepancy between the, the experiment and the theory, which is the, the yellow region, it becomes biggest. And we can actually plot that also here, that for this 0-2 dimer, we see that at finite field, that uh, the discrepancy becomes biggest. Finally, we can also zoom in to the actual crossings where you go through this 2 impurity condo screening phase. So these are the white dots here. And then you see that for both these dimers, we see that at that point, we recon reconstitute a condo peak but this, I, I emphasize once more, is a condo peak resulting from a degeneracy between three states and is part of the, uh, the two impurity condo phase. Okay, so our ability now to manipulate half integer spins uh, allows us to make spin chains that should show spin on physics. So that becomes the next step of the talk. And, and here I really want to uh, want to show that what I'm what I'm going to show now is an attempt to uh, to um, do something in the spirit of this workshop, namely to make a system that is uh, interesting from an, uh, a theoretical perspective, and and that we could really uh, provide new answers by building it uh, that you could not uh, just calculate if you were if if you. Uh, to, to provide uh, new answers, let's say, uh, uh, in a system that could not be calculatable if, if, if you were large enough. So, um, and a particular example of such a situation is the spin one half XXZ Heisenberg chain in the transverse field. So the Hamiltonian for this, this, uh, this system is shown here. So the XXZ model uh, shows um, uh, a spin half chain that is anti-ferromagnetically coupled. Um, but uh, the coupling is anisotropic. So in the transverse direction, you get a stronger coupling than in the longitudinal direction. And then we apply a magnetic field in one of the transverse directions. So let's call it the X direction. Um, and if you do that, you, uh, you at zero temperature, you go from a state that is magnetically ordered, antiferromagnetically ordered, uh, through a point uh, where you have a quantum phase transition to a paramagnetic phase where all the spins are aligned. And just before you hit that uh, critical point, you have a, a spin liquid where the, the antiferromagnetic order melts into a liquid and then refreezes into a paramagnetic phase. Yes? You don't really expect a true long range order in a one dimensional system. So I'm confused what you mean by magnetic order. So um, what I understand from this, from this myself is that if you go to the 
zero magnetic field case, you have no long range magnetic order. But for this particular case, if there is a transverse field, you do get ordered, uh, an ordered system. That's what the theorists tell me. Oh, but no, no actual broken, no spontaneously broken symmetry. You've broken the symmetry by hand by applying the magnetic field. So if you apply a field, you're not polarized. It's polarized, you have a magnetization along the field. Yes, but for small fields. For small fields, you, you still have, uh, when the field does not overcome the exchange interaction, you still have enter from magnetic order. <coughs> okay, I think that doesn't break any symmetry though, because it will be along the direction of the field, and it's perpendicular. I mean, uh, in along the field direction and opposite the field direction. So the, the direction is picked up by the field, so you haven't really broken it, spontaneously broken the symmetry. So it's, the system is running by the curve. Is it also true for finite in the chase? Finite is anyway. Sorry, can you say yeah. again which one is the largest, JZ or JPERP? Uh, JPERP is larger than, than JZ. Yeah. yeah. So, so sorry, there's many people talking now. So maybe we can. Make the question and then yep. let continue. Yeah, but by break your market, in principle, there is some place tradition when you increase magnetic field yep. uh, in, in 1D because you can you can push up the spin on the edge above the Fermi level. So this is full polarization. And, and below this full polarization, there is some. Well, there is also direct. There is a tradition for, to set the state. Maybe that's what you mean. Yes, yes, exactly. So you get a transition to what they call a paramagnetic state, where all the spins are aligned. And below the transition, you get you, the system is still antiferromagnetically ordered. Okay. It's, it's not but it's not saturated, it's paramagnetic. Paramagnetically. It's not saturated, it's all there. Okay. <coughs> well, uh, anyway, uh, this, this, is, <laughs> this system is, is, uh, is also realized in, for example, cesium cobalt chloride. It's, it's a compound and it's known that there is a second order quantum phase transition at, at this point. This, this plot is taken from this paper, it's not, it's not mine. I'm just saying that, that you, you have this transition, that is a, that is a well studied system uh, as far as I know. Yeah. Let, let's discuss that then. Yeah. Yeah. So um, how do we actually build this? So uh, of course our cobalt atoms are spin 3 half and not spin 1 half. But since we have this nice property that the spin, the plus or minus three half doublet is pushed away by the crystal field, you can essentially say that you have spin one half as, you, as long as you make sure that the coupling between your spins is low enough in energy not to compete with this 2D. So if I make sure that all my energy scales in my chain are lower than this energy, six millivolts, I can be sure that the collective states of my chain are all in the subspace of plus or minus two states. Um, however, in order to really call this a spin one half chain, I still have to take account of the fact that I'm actually dealing with spin three halves, and therefore I switch to this uh, to this XXZ Hamiltonian. Um, and so, in our case, this JZ is actually one eighth of J burp. Um, and if we do this transformation, this is not very important, but we also need to include a next nearest neighbor term uh, in the perpendicular direction, but I emphasize that this next nearest neighbor term is not a physical next nearest neighbor term, it's just one that arises due to the fact that you make this transformation. Now if I, so this picture was for the infinite case, if I look this, at this, uh, this very interesting physical system in the finite situation, we see that um, there is this critical field crossing here to the what I call paramagnetic phase, but before that you have, th there is also a bunch of ground state crossings. And depending on how long you make the chain, more ground state crossings uh, appear. And at each of these crossings, we see that the magnetization increases stepwise, and that also the number of spin-ons increases by two. So there's really spin-on physics happening here. So you just enter new domain walls into the system until the point where all the spins are pointing along the field. Now there's another important energy scale here. So there's the first excited state, which is the zero mode, which is related to the Majorana mode that's seen in other states. It's very similar. But then, the, more importantly, there's this excitation to the next, the second excited state, to the continuum. Um, and as long as you make sure that all the energy scales in your experiment, so like the temperature, are below this energy scale, which is the case in our situation, you can say that you are effectively working in the zero temperature limit for this transition. Okay, so let's switch to the experiments. So these are experiments taken on the first atom of a five-atom chain and the first atom of a six-atom chain. So an odd-number chain and an even-number chain. 
And we take here a spectrum for every 200 millitesla on an atom. So we, we have a fully automated system where we can pull back the, the tip only one nanometer. Uh, and we make very small steps in the field so that the induced drift is less than half an atom diameter. So fully automated, we can always find back the same atom and take a new spectrum. So there's really many spectra here uh, that allows for a very dense uh, picture. Now, what, as expected, we see that on the uh, odd numbered chain, we start with the divergence. Whereas on the even number chain, we start with the convergence because you, you start with a single triplet excitation uh, and that, that quickly crosses into a, a ground state crossing. Now we can, we can model this quite well, first of all, with a normal spin three half Hamiltonian. Uh, and then we see here that these curves, these, by the way, is the same line shapes that uh, come from Marcus's model again. Um, you see that the, the, the agreement is quite well. The only thing missing here is this crossing. And that's because, as we know before, the model cannot capture this condo peak over here. So therefore, the crossing is not quite visible, but I can assure you it is there also in the theory. Now, can we also model this as a spin one half XXZ chain? The answer is yes, and that's not a surprise because this is just a formal mapping. And you see that, that the same features appear here, except, of course, for this higher spin three half multiplet. Okay, so this was just data taken on the first atom of a five atom chain and the first atom of a six atom chain. Of course, we also took data on the remaining atoms in these chains. So that is shown here. And then we took the same data on all chain lengths from one atom to nine atoms. And that together is shown here. And I really want to say again that on each atom we took data on every 200 millitesla. So the total number of spectra here is more than 2000. There's a lot of data here and that is really made possible by this automated measurement technique. And okay, we see many things happening over here, especially in the longer chains, it becomes very complex. But let's just look at the, at the predicted ground state crossing locations. So we can, we can calculate this um, and we see them here. So, so of course, for a single atom, you, you don't have a crossing except for a zero field. For two atoms, you have one crossing, one, one transition, uh, and that matches up nicely in our experiment. Uh, for three, you have one. For four atoms, you have two. And then we see that the first excitation is on the outer atom, the second on the inner atoms. Um, and so forth, for six, we see three excitations, first on the outer, second on the one but outer, third <coughs> on the inner. So it all works quite well. So what, what we're looking at here is, in my view, is the beginnings of what in the long limit, in the infinite limit, would become a critical behavior. So um, you can see here, this is the calculated order parameter of the chain of eight atoms. You see here that at, at each crossing, this order parameter changes in a stepwise fashion. But as, as the chain gets longer, these crossings get closer to each other, and this curve, this curve becomes smoother and smoother, and in the end shows you the critical behavior around the quantum phase transition which I think is, is quite unique. And I emphasize once more that this, uh, this um, Hamiltonian of the XXZ model in transverse field is non-integrable and therefore cannot be solved. So no one really exactly knows what is going to happen in the infinite limit. Uh, and therefore these experiments are quite useful to show this for the first time as a function of the system size with local precision. So with that, I come to the end of my talk. I would like to... Uh, quickly summarize. So first of all, I've shown you that we can see the magnon dispersion in a ferromagnetic bit, and we can see the role of these magnons in the flipping process. Uh, we can explore the two impurity condo problem by applying magnetic fields and really go through the two impurity condo screening phase. And finally, recently, we have seen the beginnings of a quantum phase transition in these uh, spin one half XXZ models in transverse field. And with that, I thank you for your attention.